Hi again. The next two speakers are coming from the 3D Geoinformatic group at the TU Delft. And they are Balat Dukai and Ravi Peters. And they will uh, speak about uh, building uh, 3D models for, uh, for the cities and for the building. So, hi, both of you. And, Hello. Uh, I leave the stage at you and uh, good presentation. Yeah, thank you, Luca. Uh, I will kick off this uh, presentation. My, my name is uh, Ravi Peters and uh, as said, I am from the, the 3D Geoinformation Research Group based uh, in the uh, Technical University of Delft. Uh, and uh, both uh, me and Balash are working in this research group. And since uh, sh sometime shortly, we also uh, work in a th commercial spin-off uh, of that research group called 3D GI, and here we take more like practical assignments that do not fit so well in a in a research group setting. Um, so that's a very short introduction of us. Uh, basically, we're researchers and programmers. Uh, and then uh, let's all move on to the to the main topic of this uh, presentation, which is uh, creating a 3D city model for the whole of the Netherlands. Uh, and before we, we dive into the technicalities, we uh, maybe it's good to uh, to see why uh, you would want this uh, kind of 3D models in the first place. Um, actually, there are many uses, and uh, here on this slide you see some examples of people that use our data. Uh, we released uh, the first version of this uh, detailed 3D data set uh, earlier this year, and what you see here are all uh, people. Uh, that we didn't know uh, that, that found our data and it's an open data set so they can easily download it and they applied it to their own use cases for instance you can see a flood simulation here 3d printing uh, computational fluid dynamic uh, simulation so that's for wind uh, wind simulation uh, we can see shadow analysis and solar potential uh, analysis uh, and there's there's more uh, uh, applications thinkable uh, even. Um, so in the Netherlands uh, there are there's quite a good uh, set of open data uh, sets available and sp specifically for this uh, data set that we're talking about today the 3D Bach it's called uh, we use uh, two open data sets in the Netherlands the first is the Bach which is uh, uh, basically 2D footprints of all the buildings in the country and uh, the second open data sets that we use uh, from our government is called the AHN, which is uh, a point cloud data set for the entire country. And basically, we combine these two data sets to generate automatically our uh, 3D buildings. Uh, then uh, this is the website of the 3DBAG data set. Uh, so you can actually visit it yourself if you want to. It's, it's on 3DBAG.nl. Uh, if you go to the website, you'll see uh, something like this. So you'll see our, our 3D buildings uh, uh, in a kind of a nice viewer uh, where you can explore the data. And then there's also a download page where you can download the data uh, in tiles uh, in different formats like uh, OBG, GeoPackage, CityJSON. There's also some web services like uh, WFS. And you can also get the raw uh, Postgres uh, data dump. Um, so uh, we distribute the data then actually in, in various ways. So there's of course the, the fully 3D models, but we also have a 2D layer, which is actually illustrated here. So this is like a projection of the, the height information to a 2D data set, because we found that many users are actually still, uh, uh, depending on software that does not really, uh, uh, they cannot really use fully 3D data, but they can use, let's say the 2D data plus height uh, uh, for a, Polygon. So that's why we offer it actually in two uh, sets there as well. Um, and then, of course, at the core of this uh, generating this data set, there's kind of an automated algorithm. And what this algorithm does is it takes uh, for a given building, uh, we take this uh, 2D footprint from the Bach data set, uh, and we combine that with uh, the HN point cloud, which you can see here on the, on the left. And basically from those two inputs, we fully automatically generate a 3D uh, building mesh, which you can see here. And of course, uh, we do this 
many times because there's 10 million buildings in the country and it is fully automatic. So uh, just with the press of a button, basically we start this process and it takes uh, uh, like about two days and then we have uh, 3D models for the whole uh, country. So very briefly, the reconstruction method, how does that work? Um, well, like I said, the two sets of input are the 2D footprint, which you can see here in, in the gray line, uh, the gray uh, rectangle here. And then we have the point cloud, and the point cloud is classified, so uh, there's labels on the points which tell us if, if a point belongs to a building or to, uh, for instance, a ground. So this is actually the two classes in the point cloud that we use. Uh, so that's the input, basically, which you can see here in, in the first image. And then the first thing that we do is that we run a plane detection algorithm in this point cloud, which means that we detect uh, planar surfaces in the point cloud. So you can see here with the different colors, different planar surfaces detected in the point cloud in the second figure. Um, and then uh, building on uh, from that, uh, we derive uh, the boundary geometry from those detected planar segments, which you can see here in the, in the third image. So you can see two types of, uh, of lines that are detected. One is the, the blue uh, one that you see here, which are the boundary lines. So the, these are just the boundaries of the, the planar segments that we detect in the point cloud. And we also detect the intersections between adjacent planes. So for instance, on the gable roof of this building, uh, there's uh, two planes uh, intersecting at the, the top. And this, uh, you can see this is a red line there. Now, based on these uh, lines that we detect, uh, we actually make a subdivision of the 2D footprint, which you can see in the fourth image here. So we project all these lines that we detect in, uh, in 3D. We project them down to, uh, it, uh, to the 2D footprint, and we subdivide this footprint, uh, let's say, in, the, in, in, in 2D, basically. So here, actually, it becomes kind of a 2D uh, method. Um, and then uh, the next step, then, is to... Uh, to assign to all the, the cells that are formed in this uh, 2D subdivision of the footprint, to assign to each cell the appropriate roof plane that we detected earlier in, the, in step two. So you can see here, for instance, for the, the, the top cell, which is orange, you can see it corresponds to the, the orange plane in step two, uh, which is on the other side of the building. And the purple plane, you can see as well, so in this step, we uh, we start with the, the polygons subdivided into cells, and we end with uh, uh, a nicer version of that, which also has the information of which plane be belongs to which cell. Uh, and there's also optimization going on to ensure that uh, the result here fits tightly with the point cloud, and it also leads to a, a simple model, so a model that has a low number of faces, vertices, and edges. And then the final step is an extrusion from this uh, 2D partition of the footprint, and that uh, uses the, the 3D building mesh, which is shown here in step six. So this is very briefly uh, the, the basic steps of the reconstruction algorithm. And of course, there's always some exceptions uh, that you see in, in, with the real world data. So I will show you one here. Uh, so on the left side, you see the point cloud. So the building points are shown in green, and uh, the, the ground points in blue. And what you can see here is that actually the 2D input that we uh, have for this building, so that's the, the building footprint from the Bach data set, it does not contain this uh, portion of ground in the middle of the building. Um, and then if it's not there uh, in the footprint, then uh, basically that means that then we have no data there. And uh, this kind of gives a funny reconstruction result where the algorithm tries to fit uh, kind of one of the adjacent planes to that hole in the in the building, like, uh, and you get the results shown on the right. Uh, but we we improve this. Uh, uh, we, we we implement an, like a special uh, functionality for this, where also the ground points are taken into consideration. And if we find that there's a, a large portion of ground points inside of the the footprint of the building, we cut this out and we make a hole in the three D mesh. Um, so with that, uh, now you all know how to reconstruct one building. And then Balash is going to uh, explain a little bit of how to scale this up to the entire company. Yeah, so uh, Balash, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ravi. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, OK. All right. <laughs> Just uh, mandatory checks in these uh, virtual meetings. So 
Until now, Ravi was talking about how to do it this for a single building, and now I'm going to take over and then tell you how to do this for all the buildings in the Netherlands. And uh, I think, uh, Ravi, you mentioned that there are about 10 million buildings that we have. So there are 10 million building polygons uh, that we have in the input data set. And as far as I remember, we have about 600 billion points, which is between two and three terabytes of uh, compressed point cloud data. Now, we could take all this input, uh, all this source data, and just dump it in the reconstruction in a single process. I believe it would complete, it would finish. However, it would take like forever. So it's not really feasible to do it so. Therefore, we chop it up in smaller parts and uh, process each part um, parallelly, so besides each other. And uh, these parts, we call it tiles. And uh, each tile uh, contains more or less equal number of buildings, so equal number of building polygons as an input. And uh, the important part of this is that uh, uh, ensuring that the, the amount of uh, input in each, uh, in each tile is more or less uh, balanced that uh, the process, processes that we are running in parallel, they complete more or less in the same time. So there's no super long uh, running processes that overload the, the system. That is one thing. The other thing is that in this case, also the output that we uh, that we are producing, they uh, this, this way we can keep the file sizes in check. Now, a nice way to, to achieve this, uh, this subdivision of tiles if, if we use a quad tree, and that's what you will see uh, that is what you see in the in the red uh, with the red rectangles in this image. Those are practically the leaves in a quad tree that contains about a few thousand, uh, maximum a few thousand uh, models each. To run all this and uh, and control all this, we've written a, a tool which we very inspiredly call tile processor, <laughs> and basically it processes a bunch of tiles. Uh, and matches the input, uh, so matches the source data set to this size, both the footprint polygons and also the the point clouds. Now, this is, uh, and on the top of that, there's like an orchestration systems. And, and when, it, when it's running and when it's running well, this is how our, it feels more or less <laughs> when uh, it goes goes good. Now, I'm going to show you in, in the next slide of uh, basically what the parts are of uh, of our process, uh, because I don't want to say pipeline, since we have multiple pipelines in the whole process, uh, if I call it. And in this, uh, in this figure that I, that I drew with my, <laughs> with my hand, the, the rectangles are basically, each of them is an in individual pipeline, and each pipeline consists of several steps. So I guess you can imagine one step would do something like download the, the footprints, or download the, the point cloud files, and then a sequence of the steps that would process it, process the full, uh, process the data, clean the data, uh, chop it up into tiles, and so on and so forth. So uh, we start with ingesting the the different uh, source data sets, and then uh, we retire them, both the both the footprints and also also the point clouds, also the point cloud. Then we go on to reconstruction, and this is where the type processor that I mentioned um, and uh, and the reconstruction algorithm that uh, Ravi described come into play. And then once that is completed, then uh, we repackage the output and we prepare the exports that uh, that are possible to download then uh, through the website. And then we have a quality control uh, check after that. Um, the underlying storage for this is PostgreSQL. And uh, we also store some files, like as flat files in the regular file system. For instance, the point cloud uh, is stored in the file system, while all the vector uh, vector polygon input is, is stored in the database and also written uh, to the database, except with a few exceptions, uh, for instance, like the OBJ files, which we directly write out to the file system. There's no point to store them in the, in the database. So, and on the top of this, we have a tool called Dexter, which we didn't write, write ourselves, but it's a very nice tool. Um, for data orchestration, basically. And uh, I believe the next slide, if, uh, yes. Uh, so I, I created a separate slide for this because I assume that at least there are some of you who are not familiar with, with this, because it's a relatively new thingy. It's an 
it's an open source tool developed by a company very similar to Apache Airflow or Prefect, which are would be direct competitors to this. But essentially, um, what it helps, it uh, it helps to run a sequence of, of uh, processes and then pass metadata or actual data between these steps. This is very, very simplistic explanation. It has a nice uh, graphical user interface and, and what I, I what you can see here is the the pipeline for the reconstruction itself. And one of these boxes would be, um, uh, for instance, the box that I selected is the actual type processor that is running in that box. So, however, although it's a graphical user interface, it's not like a drag and drop tool. Um, everything is written in Python. So we've written like many, many thousands of lines of code uh, to have all this thing up and running. Now, uh, on um, working on these uh, data processing tasks and developing uh, researching data processing tasks is a little bit uh, tedious at some times because by its nature, the easiest way to verify if something is correct uh, is to look at the data, so look at the output. We have many of many many unit tests, or, but they are not sufficient in itself. And the best way, when uh, when the model is generated, to check if it's good, is just open the model and see if it's good as as we expect. So now in our uh, daily situation, it works like, for instance, uh, Ravi or me. Uh, we we do some changes in the code, and we are happy with uh, with the changes. Then we send a commit to, we commit it to GitHub. And uh, we put in the commit message, we tag the number of the tile, so the tile number that we would like to execute, for instance, one, two, three, four. Then in return, GitHub sends out a webhook and uh, we wrote a small, basically web app then that listens to these webhooks and uh, starts a process to build so pull the code from GitHub, build the code, and then install the code. And this is done with Ansible. And one, once the, then this is done, it, we receive an email from Ansible that, okay, everything is correct, or if something has failed. And if some, everything is correct, then Dexter takes over, pretty much the pipeline that you've seen in the previous slide, uh, to reconstruct this, uh, this single tile, uh, one, two, three, four. And once that is done, we also receive an email, and we can check the results in QGIS. Uh, by directly connecting to the remote database on our server and uh, and checking the 3D models that were stored there. Now, this is very, very handy because normally on our laptop, we store just a small amount of data, like for a neighborhood or a couple of buildings, which are good for running uh, tests in a few seconds. Uh, but every now and then to test for these edge cases that Ravi mentioned, uh, it's good that uh, we have a selection of these troublesome tiles that, uh, that we have on our in our list and we want to test those and that's what uh, what allows this. I assume uh, most of you would say yeah, this is pretty much a continuous integration. There's not much <laughs> special thing in it. That is true. Um, the thing is that we use it for research and development so I guess we could call it continuous research and development <laughs> in this case. Um, now I'm going to say a few words uh, about the quality of the data and uh, and to wrap it up this presentation. I would say, so we have a geometric validity over 98%, uh, which we measure with a tool called Valtridity, which was developed by one of our colleagues called Hugo Ledu. So this is the 3D, uh, the geometric validity for the 3D models in level of detail two. Uh, then we have another measure, which, uh, which is the root mean square deviation or root mean square error between the point cloud and the, and the reconstructed model. So basically we, we measure how close is the model is to the point cloud and our reference is the point cloud, yes. Uh, that's a, that could be a shortcoming, but the truth is we don't have any other ground tools or, or reference to compare it to. Um, so in our case, in case of the LOD2 models, we are under five centimeter deviation, which is pretty close. But if we check, for instance, the, the mean uh, and the standard deviation, then we see that, okay, I believe uh, uh, there are some outliers because our standard deviation is, I think, like 25 centimeters. But the average uh, root mean square is still under 10 centimeters. 
Um, and uh, the outliers show that, so generally the, these graphs show that actually things go pretty well, except when they don't. And when they don't go well, they, uh, there are these situations when, for instance, there is no occlusion in the point cloud. Uh, since uh, our reconstruction method uh, heavily relies on the quality of the point cloud itself, so the input data quality. And uh, because uh, the point cloud that we use is collected through area, aerial uh, laser scanning, uh, we have these church towers that often cast a shadow on the church uh, roof itself, creating this gap of, uh, 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 gap of points and in that case, uh, we have a reconstruction error, for instance, that, that you see on the left-hand side. Now, to wrap it up, uh, the way we distribute this data is uh, either via 2D layers, uh, because we've seen that uh, the people like 2D still very much, and they are served with a regular WFS, WMS, with GeoServer, or uh, flat files that I uh, simply served with Nginx. And um, the feedback so far has been quite positive. I would say overwhelmingly positive. Um, if, Ravi, could you go to the, to the next slide? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, because uh, the way we know is that uh, we follow, either we follow the forums where people talk about uh, the data set, and we also have a direct uh, feedback forms which are simple Google forms. We have two of them. One is a more detailed feedback form and one is to report errors with particular buildings where a user can click on a building and report that, okay, this building has such and such uh, such errors. We use these, uh, these individual building uh, error reports then in our quality, quality validation checks later on. Um, I believe that was more or less the, the content of our presentation. For the very, very end, I wanted to tell you a few things what, what we have uh, in our mind for the future. Well, in the, in the upcoming few months, we are going to work on, we are already working on integrating newer point cloud, higher quality point cloud, possibly, or different uh, point cloud sources in our, in our process. Uh, we are streamlining our infrastructure to make it even more efficient if possible. Um, we are considering that maybe we could expand to other countries, but of course we are depending on very much what the available data sets are, and we want to have a stable release in 2022. A big question and a hard question for us for the coming months is how could we make this uh, sustainable on the long term, so that we can uh, sustainably serve the, uh, the data as open data and keep it so. So with this, I would like to thank you for the attention. And uh, I believe I need to mention at this point that uh, we received funding from the European Research Council and many other uh, organizations from the Netherlands. And uh, without that help, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to get the project to this level and to continue. Thank you. So thanks a lot. It was really impressive that the work that you did. So there are some questions, but uh, some of them you already answered on during the presentation, but uh, I will uh, ask you again, because uh, maybe you can give some more information about that. And uh, the first one is, do you know if this approach is feasible for other countries? So, because mm, at least for Italy, it doesn't exist a, a data set or the two data set the input data set that you are using and probably also other countries are in the same situation, so. Uh, yes, so I, can, I can take that one. Um, so basically, yes, the, the answer is yes. Uh, as long as you have, uh, let's say, input data that's comparable that, to the ones that we use. So that's, let's say, a point cloud with a density of around 10 points per square meter. And also kind of important uh, right now is that you have the different uh, point cloud classes for ground and building at least so that you don't have uh, vegetation points that are uh, inside the buildings uh, because that can cause issues so uh, a classified point cloud with sufficient density and of course uh, building footprints that are well aligned with the point cloud if you have that 
uh, then the, uh, yes, you you could uh, you could do that. So. Okay, thanks. So this is the most uh, voted one. Is what is the most computationally expensive step in the process? Um, maybe I can answer this one. Actually, funny thing is writing the geo package files. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least that is the one that takes the longest. Uh, for us, it takes about five days to write all the geo package files. And I'm pretty sure we could optimize uh, some things in there. So we, we write from Postgres. Uh, and in the geo package, we have, I think, believe six layers, 2D and 3D included. Uh, but besides that, uh, is the reconstruction itself, which takes us for about four days uh, in itself. For the whole country? For the whole country, yes, yes. Yeah, I would say two, two to four days. Uh, depends a bit on, like, it changes a bit with every new or release. Uh, yeah. You know. yeah. Okay. I imagine that can also be uh, actually optimized a lot further. So, other question is, uh, how do you start building under the trees or where the point cloud may be noise or sparse? You already showed something during the presentation, but... Uh... Yes. Um, yeah, so first of all, like I said, we depend on the classification in the point cloud. So if there are uh, trees that are, let's say, overhanging a building, then those points are filtered out because they have a different class than the building points. Uh, but then, of course, uh, as rightly pointed out here but by this... Uh, question, then there's still uh, less uh, points uh, below there on the building. And uh, yeah, so the algorithm basically tries to fit one of the detected planes uh, in that part where there's no data. Um, and um, yeah, usually that works out well. Uh, but uh, in cases uh, where you see uh, problems in the point cloud, and this is also ex like some, some really difficult situations are where there's glass roofs on buildings, because this is hard to measure with LiDAR. Uh, and then you see sometimes that uh, the reconstruction result is a bit distorted. Uh, and it's also a bit similar to what uh, Bala showed uh, with the church tower, where there's yeah. there's a problem of no data. And the algorithm does uh, best what it can do based on, on the data that's there. But uh, of course, if the data is, has limitations, then that shows in the, in the output as well. Yeah. yeah. Um... About this, there was a, another question. Is the point cloud classified, uh, classified beforehand? And if so, how and uh, into yes. what groups? Yeah, so like I mentioned, the, the point cloud that we use, the, the yeah. Dutch uh, national point cloud is called AHN. Uh, you can, it's also open data, so you could download it yourself if you're interested. Uh, the, the version that we use has five classes. Uh, this is uh, ground, building, uh, water, uh, some kind of special objects that are managed by the Dutch governments, like bridges. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is the, the other points. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is done, how, how it's done, it's, I think it's semi-automatic, semi-manual. Uh, yeah, but this is not something that we do, we just use uh, what, what the government uh, provides. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, on the ground part uh, removing, how does it work in a developed environment? Uh, yeah, so then well, actually what happens there is that the ground points are also uh, used for the plane fitting. So if there's a sloped uh, ground, then uh, hopefully a, a nicely sloped plane will be fitted there. And then it will be uh, uh, yeah, assigned to, to, uh, to a ground part. And then we know that we can remove that part from the building. The, the the bottom of the building let's say the floor of the building is always set to the the, the lowest uh point that's found in like a small buffer around the building it's like a fifth percentile of the lowest points and uh, i think it's like a four meter radius around the building now uh yeah okay so the time is over thanks a lot again for your presentation it was really interesting thank you for having me thank you see you around uh, i want just to remember that now on the malena liberman stage there is the agm the osgeo agm and uh, it's open to everyone i suggest you to to join and to 
uh, to listen what OSGEO is doing and uh, the stuff related to OSGEO. Um, that's all, and thanks again to the uh, European Commission that uh, support this uh, this track. And see you in the around and in the next time.